Thanks a lot to uh, Michael and Rasmus for inviting me. Um, this is a, a different kind of talk from the talks you've probably been hearing over the summer school. Uh, there is a hashing component to it, but it's hidden. And also, it's more of a bad news talk than a good news talk. I'm not telling you how to do hashing. I'm telling you what situations where hashing is not going to help you. In other words, I'm going to talk about those ones. So as, as such, this is, by, this is, by the way, joint work with my students. Uh, Amir Abhi 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 it took me a long time to understand them if I can claim to have understood them myself. So I'm not expecting that you will, I, would, I, won't, I don't think I can actually explain all of them in great detail at this talk, but I'll hope to give you some kind of high level idea of how these different ideas fit together and what part of them might be useful in, in your ongoing work. So the story involves a number of different things. One part of the story are these things called written divergences. Uh, these are uh, distance-like functions that are very popular uh, and well-studied in machine learning. Um, I'll say a little bit about them. They're important for various reasons. And they also have a very nice connection to, to geometry because they, in some ways they generalize standard uh, point-line duality, projective duality that we use in computational geometry in a very interesting way. So that's one element of what I'll be talking about. But in particular, what I'm talking about is doing near-neighbor search with these divergences. Again, this is interesting because near-neighbor search in particular is a very interesting problem. And these distance functions come up in a lot of problems, in, especially in image analysis and in speech analysis and in audio. Um, and so we want to look at near neighbor search, we're looking at approximate near neighbor search. But what I'll be talking about today, in fact, I, we, we have some prior work on how to do near neighbor search. And we want to see how far we could push the work and then we hit a roadblock. And the roadblock will be what I'll talk about, which is basically lower bounds. In particular, we're talking about lower bounds for hashing like structures. Our basic idea was, well, we want, we have this weird geometry and we want to do near neighbor search with it. We know that locality assisted hashing is this awesome tool to do. Uh, build a data structure for doing near-neighbor search. Can we do LSH type things for these strange distance functions? And this paper is basically one way of saying probably not. And that's what I want to be talking about in, a, in this cell phone part. And I'll explain all of what, what all these things are. You don't have to know any of them right now. But really central to all of this, even though this is what the talk is about, what's really going on underneath is something which is far deeper and, uh, and a lot of people have worked on for many, many years, is this idea of these what I call isoprimitive inequalities in the hypercube. It's a way of saying basically that any interesting function you define on the Boolean hypercube has high expansion. It expands out in strange ways. And because of that, that tool, that, that tool of expansion allows you to prove that prove lower bounds on many problems. It's a very powerful tool. It, in one form, it goes back to the late 80s, but it's been used, especially in the last 10 years, if you look at the work of Brian O'Donnell and others, has been used very successfully for all kinds of problems. And we're going to be using a, a generalization of that that we can use here, which might be interesting. And that, of course, connects to things that you may be more familiar with, things like casual hashing, and also this partial match problem, which is like the, the core hard problem in this, in this area of the world that we live in. So that's sort of the lens, the overall large sort of the, the global map of the things that I'll be referring to. And now I'll try to drill down into some of these more specific things and explain what we're doing. And feel free to interrupt at any point with questions or anything you have. Uh, you know, it's uh, giving a high level view, but I'm happy to drill down for anyone. So let's start with in a kind of natural way, but they're, uh, and then we'll see in a second why they define this way. So it's, it, they're parameterized. So the idea is you give me a convex function p, and I'll give you a distance function, parameterized by p, and it's in the following manner. So given any convex function p, you define this the p phi p comma q as, as this weird function up there. Geometrically speaking, what's happening is that to estimate the distance from p to q, and this is directed, so the distance from q to p is different, you look at what would approximated the convex function phi by its first order approximation entry, which would be basically the second two terms in that expression. It will be phi of q plus the gradient term. And that will be that line there. Of course, that's a first order approximation. That's a convex function. So it's always going to be below the true value. So there's going to be some difference. And that difference is your distance. It's a very weird way to define distance. Okay. But think of it as a, as, a, as a measure of like a second order term. So like how, how convex is if this function were linear, for example, this distance would always be zero. So why is this interesting? It's interesting because by plugging in different values of the convex function phi, you get different functions that we actually recognize and that we wouldn't have known are part of the same family if we didn't have this common framework. In particular, the square Euclidean distance is a member of this family. You plug in phi that is equal to x squared, you get this function. You get this chapter. More interestingly, a very uh, core measure in intuition theory called the relative entropy or the Kullabi or divergence of the cross entropy depending on what you've you read also can be represented in this form. Again, you just plug in a different context. There is a measure that's used in, uh, in speech, in audio processing, uh, uh, not speech, sorry, audio processing. It's named 
named after the good people who wrote the book. But again, it's a member of this family. And again, I've just mentioned three of the more well-known ones, but there are other ones you can plug in for any context. And that's the point. The point is that they're all related by the way they're constructed. And that means they share certain properties. They share some other properties as well. Some other actually very nice properties from the statistical point of view. In particular, so let's, before you rename the slide, let's just imagine we're talking about a Gaussian issue. We know that a Gaussian distribution can be written as a law, can be written as e to the minus some the value x minus the mean squared divided by some favorable variance. Let's say it's a very simple one-dimensional Gaussian. So what you're saying is that if you look at the mean and you look around it, the density falls off exponentially, controlled by the squared Euclidean distance of that point you're looking at from the mean. Okay. So Gaussian exponential fall off, squared Euclidean. Suppose I didn't have a Gaussian. Suppose I had a different kind of function that was part of this general family of what I call exponential distributions. Not the exponential distribution, but a general class of distribution, like a multinomial or a Poisson. It turns out they have the same fall off, but the fall off is no longer measured with respect to squared Euclidean distance. It's measured with respect to something else. It turns out for every, every such distribution that something else is an associated Bregman divergence. So in some sense, the Bregman divergence capture the natural notion of distance in terms of fall off. Right. For Gaussian, the natural fall off is, is squared Euclidean, which is why Gaussians and Euclidean seem to go together so well. Right. Whenever you think of one, you tend to think of the other. But for a multinomial, it's a KL divergence, and so on. So that's so these diagram questions are not just a generalization of Euclidean distance in the, in the geometric sense. They're also a generalization in terms of um, modeling distributions. In some sense, if you're dealing with a certain kind of distributions, this is the right distance. So 
cluster are algae from super temperatures. And to understand where this asymmetry comes from, it helps to kind of really look at what this breakdown that is exactly doing and get a bit more geometry. So you can use an algebra and rewrite the expression that should not be surprising from my very first definition that you can write this as a second order expression. After all, it's a different you know, function, it's a first order approximation. It has to be some kind of second order term. Right? And of course, it's a second order term in the in, in a vector space, you're dealing with things like the Hessian you know, and remember, since this is convex, this will be positive. Which means that if you if you go to the limit when the two points become arbitrarily close, the distance from Q to Q starts looking like this, which is a very well-known distance in, in uh, sort of data analysis. It's called the Mahalo distance. It's basically a skewed Euclidean distance. You take instead of all distances and all axes being the same value and all axes being orthogonal, you're transforming it by linear transformation, a non-singular linear transformation, and you're measuring it. So your ball becomes a linear system. So at, at in infinitesimally, these breakthrough divergences all look like a Mahalo distance. And if that were the case, that would be very easy because <coughs> you can easily transform a fixed uh, linear transformation space just by a standard you know, diagonalization and you can just get another Euclidean distance. It's a very easy to construct a scenario. So a, a, a space with a skewed Euclidean distance is the same as a space with a Euclidean distance from the point where the algorithm is at. You just insert an appropriate the problem, of course, is that this changes as you go across the field. So in some places you look almost okay, in some places you look very skewed one way, in some places you look skewed another way, and that's where the complexity of these divergences is formed. That it's a non-uniform. It's almost, one of the things you like, it's like having a Riemannian manifold with variable curvature. At every point, for any fixed point, the curvature gives you a fixed local Euclidean space without changes. And so you can quantify this notion of asymmetry in many ways. What we'd like to do is say, okay, we have an algorithm, we want to algorithm and run it on these strange distance functions, and our running time will depend on normal parameters like n and d and epsilon, but it will also depend on some structure constant of the distance function. And we'd like to produce such a number that we can get a handle on, say, okay, look, if this number is small, we are well behaved, if this number is one, we reduce to the standard case, and if it's large, we keep on going back. And so you can define, and in, and in previous works, people have studied these things, you can define a symmetry of the distance. They're all more or less equivalent. And I say more or less in the sense that if the overall curvature of your space is bounded, they're all bounded. And if the asymmetry, that simple expression, the ratio of going one way to the other is unbounded, then they're all unbounded. But they're not equivalent to each other. They can, they can vary among each other. But for purposes of discussion, they're more or less the same. And if you focus on just the first one, the, the going round to going coming ratio, that's the number we want to think about as a measure of the badness of the
results for low dimensions, which is a, a code word for we don't care what the right time dependence on is. It can be exponential or whatever. In the, in the literature, we call that low dimensions. But, but you can do nearest neighbor search in low dimensions fairly well, but I won't talk about it. And the final piece of the first puzzle is we're going to show lower form, so I must give you a model. And we're working on a model that's reasonably well studied in this data structure world. It's called a sulfur model. And the idea is I build a data structure. And I'm going to make queries to structure. So I'm going to express my bounds in terms of how many lookups I need to make in the structure. I don't care about what other computation I do. It's a lower bound, so my actual right now is going to be worse, but that's what I'm going to do. Okay, and this has been used very successfully for all kinds of lower bonds for things like locality sensitive hashing and other data data structures. This is a very natural model for this. So in particular, you'll have there are you know M rows, and each row has W in it. Uh, I'm going to make R probes to solve my queries. So my query comes in, I'm going to make R probes into the structure, and I'm going to develop an answer based on that. In this paper, we work in what is called a non-adaptive setting, which is a weaker setting. It assumes that you make your R probes in parallel, in some sense, and get the answer. You're not allowed to make a probe like, oh, that's the answer, and go and change your probe to the answer. Okay, that's a weakness in some sense. You're hoping to sort of make that new answer. It's, it's easier to do for that. Um, The non-adaptive thing? So, so with, if the answer is yes, I cannot say, well, the next time I'll query is Sorry, I, I didn't understand. You're saying that uh, the adversary cannot uh, use the information by one query to change the next query, or? But the algorithm, algorithm that can't. Uh, the algorithm, so it's a, it's, a, it's a model that makes the algorithm work harder. So it's a little bit like Bloom filters. In Bloom filters, you decide and it marks exactly where you want to go, but if you have two level hashing, in the first level, you go somewhere, but that gives you a new hash function to use for the next yeah. level. So it's right. only proving lower bounds for the case where you only use the query to decide That's which right. parts of memory you ask. Okay. So Just like in Bloom filters. Yeah. Right. So this is a lower bound for certain kinds of algorithms. Yes. Not a general lower bound. No. That's the kind. That's, yeah. that's one of the kind of parts of my statement. Here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the caveats. There'll be other caveats. Okay. Um, but this is one of them. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I should say though that. Given the techniques we use, there's at least a feeling that we should be able to push it to non-adaptive setting. It seems more like a question of rolling our sleeves and doing hard work rather than a fundamental objection, but we don't have that right now. Okay, so yeah. it is a, yeah. I also think and that all Alex and Donis things for locality sensitive hashing, they, I think the algorithms that Alex presented for locality sensitive hashing were all non-adaptive. I mean, he just went to certain bins you know, right. based on the hash values and said whatever right. is in those bins, it's in all fact, they have the new, about. they have a new paper, right? Alex and others have this new paper where they show that if you are allowed to be adaptive, you can kind of push beyond what LSH just allows you to I think that's more adaptive to the data, but anyhow. Ah, okay, okay, oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I'm just saying that his lower bounds will capture the kind of stuff that Alex presented. Right. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we start, because I, like I said, we start off with LSH, we use the, where this, you can think of this as LSH type work. Cool. But thanks, thanks. So we, what we want to show in this, in this horribly written theorem here is the following. So let me try to parse out what's being said. So what we're saying is that if you do, in fact, want to build a non-adaptive data structure that has near linear space, that has sort of, uh, makes R queries to data structure to solve the problem, then the, the space you must pay is super linear in the following form, n to the 1 plus this expression right here. Obviously, if you allow more queries, you should be able to work with less space. That's why the, the R is in the denominator of the exponent. The more queries I have, the better. Right? Um, but, but this is the bond you get. And this alpha is basically the min of mu and mu over log n, where mu is my structure constant, and mu over log n comes up for a few reasons for us. Right? And the way to think about this is to not read the theorem at all, but just to do a pattern matching with what is known for well being inclusive functions, like say L1. In particular, this is a result by Panigrahit the bar reader from two years ago. Look at this bound here and compare it. They are identical, and this is not surprising. We use a lot of proof machinery. The main difference is you go from one to half. The lower bound increases. I'm saying that instead of space n to the one plus one over CR, it's space n to the one plus alpha over CR. Yeah. Just to check that I understood anything. So mu. You gave examples that mu could be almost infinite, infinite, right? Yeah, so, but, uh, that's so right. and then the min becomes the d, yeah, and then the, you have the, the horrible dependence of d. Okay. And there's a reason for that. Okay. 
Okay, spaces that asymmetrically will kill you completely. Won't kill you completely. In the sense that into these. Essentially, what happens, and this is kind of an interesting byproduct, once you get asymmetric enough, your approximate near near problem starts looking like an exact near near problem. That makes a lot of sense. And then, they, and this actually matches the known exact near near problem. Which is, uh, I was going to talk about this in a minute. The second one now is special case. Pardon me? I mean, the second, the other result is a special case. You can derive it from your result. Well, that would be a very unfair uh, rendition of the result because we use their, we use their proof technique. So, it, in a sense, like yes, but that's not really fair. L1 is not Bregman. It's not. Yeah. So that's the thing. We, we Bregman divergences have an L1-ish flavor to them. If you sniff at them long enough, they smell the long. I don't know how to explain something to say they smell like it. <laughs> so we, we, the natural suggestion was, okay, let's go look at L1. What we are thinking about is that L2 squared is a Bregman divergence. And I think it would be more reasonable for me to say L2 squared is an L1-ish flavor. I think that's something that people are more willing to accept. So that, that's, yeah, so it's not a strict, it's not a generalization to result in that sense, because they're doing this for one. So the important thing here is that, is, is, is the idea of getting this structure constant to the lower form. And I should mention this bound to be pretty big, right? Alpha is, is a, okay, this is, is mu basically, which, oh, is it a constant? Well, yes, except that it can get pretty big. And that's the point here, that as your asymmetry gets worse, you need more space, and that's kind of exactly what we want to say, that the asymmetry really controls how much work you need to Thank you. 
is one way of defining it. I give it a bunch of vectors p on the on the hand on the cube, uh, zero one cube, and I have a query vector. And I want to find if the query vector dominates any of the points in this set. So uh, for all i p, i let me just do one. This is equivalent to saying that I have a set of vectors p, and I have a vector q, which consists of zero ones in both pair symbols, and I want to see if it exactly matches. That's why, that's why it's called partial match, because we don't care. This is a more convenient way of saying they're equivalent. So it turns out that partial match nicely captures, say, the cool that we would like to use. And it's, uh, one way to see this is that if you have the cool that we would like to use here, which is pi dot pi over qi, pi, and if pi is one and qi is zero, this number is infinite. So if you, if you have any C approximate near neighbor for d pi, you're getting a solution to the partial match problem because here you cannot have pi one and q zero. Right? So there's a direct match. So if you could solve the um, the, the Bregman C approximate near neighbor problem for cool that you would like you will immediately solve partial match. You get a lower bound And that's a good lower bound because partial match is a very well studied problem. You would know, like lower bound. But again, you need this unbound term because you're relying on the infinite. Actually, you need something like this, which is a bit. So you, you can get kind of one good result, but you can't get a smooth result from that. So these are two things you can do very quickly that give you some problems. And so the, the opening of the proof is, is a little complicated. It involves, like I said, the, this idea of a directed isometric equality, but at high levels it looks something like this. So for any problem, you know, if you want to solve, if you have a randomized uh, algorithm on your board, you need some kind of hard input distribution. Okay, so you have to produce a hard input distribution. And if you want to show that any deterministic algorithm on the hard input distribution will give you a bad answer, then you smack the Gauss in the max level and then you get it. So, uh, so the way these proofs tend to work is uh, and a lot of the LSH proofs work this way. You, you build this hard input distribution and you perturb it by a loop to give some error because you're doing an approximate end of the search. And what you say is that this operator, this noise operator, you could think of it as an operator on the function defining your data structure on this page. You're building some magical data structure to solve this problem and now I perturb the data so my function, which is my hash function, changes. And then you show this function changes on the node, huge amount. Things go all over the place. And so in order to get an answer, you have to look at many different spots in the table and you look at them. This is a, this is a horribly, horribly high level proof, which, you know, the kind of thing that makes sense for about 10 seconds and after the keyboard doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> that's kind of how these proofs work. Okay? And I'll, I'll try to explain each of these blobs in a bit more detail. And I should mention that for the most part, we follow this, uh, follow the framework developed by this other paper by Kani Gari Talbar Meter, except for the old. So we sort of follow it. So I, again, there's a bunch of related work on this. Some of them go through communication complexity, some of them go through self, this kinds of arguments, and they're just a whole variety of things. The communication complexity is particularly nice. This is, you know, started off with a paper by Peter Bob Lucasen and has been developed ever since. That you can think of the probing of a data structure as a communication. You know, you have the player asking the question, you have a data structure which is talking. And so, you, by showing the communication complexity lower bound, you give a lower bound on the space needed for the data structure. Otherwise, you, you should be able to very nice set of things. All right, so now I will start trying to explain uh, how this works. Um, talk about 10 minutes more. So you, what you 
once you have this asymmetric noise over here, you can now say, okay, uh, what, what properties does it have? It has the appropriate properties we need. In other words, we take a bunch of points that are reasonably far from each other, and then we do this perturbation. Then if you look at the second set of properties, it's what you expect, namely that high of query, its distance to its near neighbor is, is uh, small, that's epsilon times v, v is the dimension of the space, and epsilon is my parameter. Its distance to any other point, which is not its near neighbor, is very big. It's mu times v. Think of mu as a much bigger number. So they think of this as a gap instance. I better get my correct answer, because if I don't get my correct answer, my approximation guarantee is going to be weak. It's going to be weak. So if I, if I do, so in other words, if I am able to solve the approximate problem for this input, I'm actually returning the exact answer. Like any kind of parties. And all these things hold my So I have a so now I have a hard instance by doing this perturbation. And this takes some work to prove, but it's not too hard to prove. More, more or less, more or less elementary. And then what you want to reason is this hard okay. What you want to say is the following: that I said I want this function, my hash function, to scatter a lot over the proof. Because I want all my points to be dispersed dispersed. One way of trying to capture this is to say, let's look at the norm of this function. A function that's flattened out a lot has a very, um, has a small elbow norm. A function that's very concentrated has a high elbow norm. Right? Because it has big peaks. So if I can show that once I take my function, apply a noise operator to a new function, that the new function has a low elbow norm, and in some way I've shown that this function is spreading out. This is what is called an isochromic transform. If you think of, for example, uh, 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 Chigo's inequality and how you can show that graphs expand, it's a special case of this. And there are many other results that are all special. The Johnson and Strauss lemma is a special case of this. They're all special case, turn up bonds are a special case of this. They're all special cases of basic ideas that things spread out. And that's the that's kind of result which is called a, a Bonami Beckner inequality that looks like this. That when you take the function, spread it out, and look at its true norm. It's less than the original norm. And there's some technical details as to why this is not true, but we can get a second from the bottom. And so the idea is that if you can show that when I take my data and perturb it using this directed operator, you can actually do this nicely, then you will be able to push through a bunch of machinery to show a lower norm to your problem. And there's only one minor difficulty with this that is not true. <laughs> it's that this is a, a well known obstacle to proving these things are not true. In particular, if you have a directed operator and you're pushing all your points to one corner of a cube, think of I have a bunch of points in a cube and I perturb them only forward. If I have points in an upper right hand corner of the cube right there and I push them even closer, they're going to get even more cramped, not less cramped. There's no way my elbow norm is going to go down, it's going to go up. Whereas with a symmetric operator, some of them are going to come back, some of them are going to go forward, and things always spread out. So you actually can't do this. What, but it turns out for the purpose that we want, it's enough to show that the function is on the other side of the space, so the lower part here. So even if it goes forward, it is kind of expanding. Okay. It's, a, it's kind of a lucky saving process. We don't need it to work over all functions, but it's, it's sufficient to work over functions that are supported over all. In other words, my hash function can only work over all. But that's one issue that makes it difficult. This took us a few months to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> and once you have that, you basically do a, do a sort of a, a not quite random walk through the literature on uh, isochromic inequalities to get the one through. Namely, what you say is that I have this asymmetric operator over a space, and I want to show that it has the right expansion properties. What I do know is that if I have a asymmetric operator over, over a biased distribution space, where the points are chosen non-uniformly, but I do a symmetric perturbation, I do have such an expansion property. So somehow I get my function to the space, I go from an asymmetric operator R to a symmetric operator tau, in a biased space, apply a, 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 a expansion of equality and get from there, which is a known result, and then pop it back in. So there's a lot of, again, there's like three pages of calculations to get this whole thing to work. Uh, but basically, you're able to show that in some weak form, you can this expands in this form. You can show that this is less than equal to that. That the noise operator for the function is less than equal to the original norm. Which is good. So you get this kind of isometric equality you need in a relationship to this. And what it means is the following. We said that the, that the function expands a lot. What it means is that, suppose think of this as being one hash bucket. All points here are hashed in a way. 
more generally, if I partition the ball around the point in, in various pieces, they go all over the place. So think of it this way. I have a point here. I'm looking for its nearest neighbor. It could be one of these points here, but they go to different locations, far away from each other. That will not work if I have to plan anything. Again, I, would, I don't want to get into the technical detail because it's long and boring, uh, but you can read the paper for that. <laughs> but that's not it. And the final thing we need to do is this very cool trick, which if you, you know, remember nothing else in this talk, I would like to give on that trick. This is a trick that, again, goes back to a paper by Milkerson and Rao and has been used frequently ever since the lower one. It's called a cell sample. It's a very beautiful idea. Um, that says the following. Suppose you want to show that there's a lower bond on, on a data structure for solving some problem. Forget about whatever I think I told you. Just take out some data structure, as you say S, you do when it queries, and you want to show that it has some lower bond in space. So fix some input points that you want to reconstruct. Input point that you want to reconstruct that is in your data. And sample a fraction of the cells of the structure you have. Okay? So think of this way. I have a query, it goes into my structure, and looks at the cells and answers based on that. I'm only going to sample a subset of these cells. So if my query hits something that's not my sample, my query goes up. Like I can't do anything. Okay, so only a few of my queries will survive this process. So only some of the queries will work. If you can show that even one of these queries worked, then you've reconstructed this point using a very small sample from the input. And then there's this wonderful inequality from information theory called funnel inequality that says that if you can, then the mutual information of this channel communicating that point to you is reasonably large, and the size of the sample must be reasonably large, therefore the size of the data structure. You can think of funnels inequality of a, of a, as a generalization of the idea that, um, of that if you have two to the n things, you need at least n things. <laughs> we all know that. Funnels inequality is that of steroids. <laughs> and it's a very important thing. So you, so you need this tool, and this again, this being used uh, by, uh, by, many, by many people to get strong lower bonds for, for certain data structure problems. Casper um, Larson has a very nice exposition of this technique in some of his more recent papers. Um, once you do that, basically, roughly speaking, the hypercontractivity that I showed you, this expansion property, implies that all the queries that you want that hopefully could work are sent to different cells. So even if I only sampled a few of them, some of them are going to work. Or at least one of them is going to work with a reasonable probability. You make the probability of that. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here now. We're getting uh, close to the end. And the base, there are a couple of different questions one can ask you, depending on what you're interested in. If you don't care about record diverse, if you do care about direct dice of record, then if there is some hint, and my, uh, Amir and I have been talking about this in the last few days, that it's not just that you can use partial match to prove a lower bond for our problem. In that, you could use direct isomerity to find a different proof of a lower bond for partial match itself. And that would be kind of interesting, that this idea of direct isomerity gives you a bit more power in your lower bond structure to prove lower bonds for some of these problems. So there's this uh, sort of fairly strong result by the hypertrust tool on, on, on lower bonds, and we're hoping to see. I mean, there may be a way to either reproduce that result or maybe even stretch it. Uh, again, I, I don't want to say I'm going to start saying wrong things that I want to say, but, but there's some hope. And again, of course, we'd like to make our results adaptive. This is kind of a, a, a knowing thing that we'd like to fix. Um, and more interestingly, I think the direct, this hypercontractivity idea, this idea of expansion, shows up not just in data structures. It shows up improving hardness of approximations in the most notable way. It shows up improving the hardness of Boolean function size, things like the understanding Boolean functions and machine learning. And does it make sense to think about this in direct assessment? We don't know, and that's the end of the If you're interested in regular divergences, on the other hand,